Well, hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Archaeology Day. Let's see, get to Archaeology Day and the Archaeological Fair 2018. I'm John Marshoni. I'm mayor of the city of Redmond. And I, I've lived here since I was four, which in terms of tonight's discussion is just a blink in time. Um, so archaeology on our Friday night, this is the right place to be. You're going to hear uh, from uh, our keynote speaker, speaker. You're going to hear from students. Now, how many Tesla students are in the room? Good. Thank you. And th thank you for your work. Um, I, I've heard nothing but good things about your work. Um, is there anyone from uh, the tribes here tonight? Uh, no, but I know the I know the city has worked with the Muckleshoots and the other tribes. And uh, tonight, you're going to learn about Redmond's local archaeology and how it relates to the region and beyond. Uh, Jenny Dellert, our, the archaeologist with Environmental Service, excuse me, Environmental Science Associates of Seattle, will present new information that continues to emerge as experts record artifacts and sites from all around the region. Redmond's archaeology logical history and its connection um, to this place with local tribes and Indians is very important to the city. Now, the project we are working on, and maybe you'll be told this later, is we were going to uh, move Bear Creek so it contained more water, better fish um, passage, and as it connects with the Sammamish River. And in the process, discovered tools and started this archaeological journey, if you will, I think it's been six or more years, you'll tell us here in a second, um, about what does this mean and how do we treat these uh, artifacts respectfully. Um, you're going to learn tonight from our keynote speaker and our students about the, our past and gain an understanding of the significance of this place and, and the rivers that, are, go through, that run through Redmond. So I know there'll be breakout sessions. Um, so I think there's going to be the Lushutsi story that will uh, connect the conference conference center rooms. Is that still going to happen, Kim? It's in progress. And uh, we now we used to talk about Redmond being well, it's 106 years old now, but we can talk about how there's been people in Redmond now for 12,000 years. Um, and how, uh, you know, if anyone complains about growth, they could. Um, <laughs> but this is going to be, this is going to be a fun night. Uh, thank you to the Tesla students and thank you for coming out to support them. And thank you f just for you archaeology buffs out in the room. I hope you really enjoy tonight. Um, this will be a fun night. So I would like to introduce Jenny Deller, our keynote speaker. Jenny? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to Kim and the mayor and the city for inviting me to be the keynote speaker. I'm really happy to be giving this presentation today and really happy to see the students' work. That will be really exciting coming up. Um, and I just want to caveat, I haven't worked directly on the sites I'll be talking about today, uh, but there's, it's, the work's been done by really good people and really good projects, so if there's any errors, that's solely on me. Um, so archaeology is all around us. Uh, there's, you know, it can lead to fascinating answers, sometimes surprises. You never know what you're going to find and where. So the presentation that I'll be giving today um, will give you an overview of archaeology in Redmond and the local region, discuss how environment plays a factor, what information archaeologists use to figure out the past, what tools are the archaeologist toolkit, and how we apply these professionally. Basically, how do we do what we do? So there's some amazing stuff in Redmond. Usually we find stuff like these little stone flakes on the left. Small, stone, pretty cool still. Sometimes we find really, really cool old stuff like the one on the right. Now my boss told me a story this morning. She said she actually squealed when they told her about this and she saw the picture of this on the, um, when we were out doing a project. So. That particular stone artifact is really, really old. We're talking, you know, six to 10,000 years old. That's pretty amazing. Um, let's see. And here's just a, 
a sample of what does it look like when we're out in the field. So you kids came out in October and had a field visit with me and some other archaeologists, and we showed you how we do you know, our surveys, and we go out and we dig, and we screen for artifacts. Well, here's us in action, right? So we dig some holes, we put the screen, the soil in the screen, and we shake it around, and we look for cultural artifacts. Sometimes we get nothing, sometimes we get really cool stuff. If we get really cool stuff, then it usually leads to testing and data recovery with you know permits and a series of contracting and project kind of related work. Um, and that's when you get the really big digs, the stuff that people think Indiana Jones does, right? So um, that's when you find the really cool stuff. How, does, how do we know where to dig? How do we know what we're doing? Well, we do a ton of background research. We look at the environmental factors. We look at historical factors, maps, so forth. Um, but the environment sets the stage for everything, right? It influences how the landscape was formed, how it changed over time, and how people used it. Oops, missing that one. So in this picture, it shows the Puget Lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. So this ice sheet um, advanced and retreated several times. Um, in the last stage was around 17,000 years ago. And then uh, within about 1,000 years, the ice retreated back. This ice is really huge. It was, this is a um, graphic in the middle there, really, really tiny. That's the skyline of Seattle. So that gives you some sort of visual representation of how massive this ice sheet was. It was 4,000 feet tall, 60 miles wide. It created all sorts of depressions and ridges and scoured the bedrock and the landscape. And that makes a you know, pretty big impression on the land. Um, and then when it, things started warming up and the ice started melting, it caused catastrophic meltwater floods, um, filled up the depressions and caused glacial lakes to form. So really, really dynamic. Um, situation. And even before the glaciers, there was tectonic and volcanic activity happening for the last couple of million years, creating the mountain ranges, Puget Sound. And um, the glaciers just kept the um, morphology moving along. So um, let's see. After the glaciers melted, there was some isostatic rebound. So the, the weight of the ice had depressed the land so much that it pushed it down. And then when, they, when the glaciers melted and retreated, the land kind of popped back up. This took a while. It wasn't instantaneous. But um, as you can imagine, that made changes to the land. And it made changes to stream gradients and stream channels and drainages and things of that nature. So it constantly was changing the landscape. So it was really, really dynamic. Well, what does that mean for humans? Well, people weren't here when the glaciers were here. There was, you know, 4,000 feet of ice. Um, so geologically speaking, you know, Puget Sound area, people have only been here maybe 13 to 16,000 years. That's a drop in the bucket compared to Africa where people have been there for eons, right? So that just gives you a little perspective of how new and um, how dynamic the Puget Sound region has been. Well, archaeology in Washington, it differs on the west side of the state versus the east side of the state. On the east side of the state, there's this gigantic um, basalt flow. It's called the Columbia River Basalt. And as you can see, it's the um, sort of the brownish area there, and it's made some channelized scablins. Um, and then with the mountain ranges there and the rain shadow, it affects the topography, it affects the climate, which affects the vegetation, which affects what resources people were using and where they might live and work and, and travel to. With the glaciers, they, when they started melting, they would form these giant glacial lakes, like Glacial Lake Missoula out in Montana. Well, then it started having catastrophic uh, meltwater floods. So water from Montana flowed all the way down, scouring out central and eastern Washington, carved out the Snake Rivers and the Columbia River, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Can you imagine? It'd be like water coursing through the Grand Canyon, right? So that changed the topography and the morphology of eastern Washington. So it looks totally different than what we find here. 
Here in Western Washington, we are focused on the marine shorelines and other shorelines like around the lakes, a lot of river drainages, things of that nature. In Eastern Washington, it's really dry, scrubland kind of um, scatterland, basalt deposit outcrops, things of that nature. Um, what, is, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for archaeology? Well, why does that matter? The differences in topography, geomorphology, geology, vegetation, and climate influence what landforms and resources were attractive and available to native groups, which in turn affected how humans interacted with their su surroundings. And in Western Washington, we have really acidic soils, which means that any of the organic materials have a really hard time being preserved. So whereas in Eastern Washington, you might get a lot of bone and things like that, antler. Here, um, for really old sites, we tend to just get lithics or very, very minimal, decayed, fragmented pieces of bone, shell, things of that nature. There's um, a handful of early sites in the Puget Sound region. Um, one of them being Bear Creek, and the other ones are um, Manus Mastodon site in Squim, there's one on Orcas Island, there's a few up in Canada. So some of our early sites, um, the graphic on the right hand side shows projectile points from sites up in Snohomish County, up in Grand Falls. Um, what we thought of as really, really early sites in the rest of North America are Clovis points. Those are the ones on the left. Those are the actual points, and they're at the Burke Museum. Um, so they're huge, they're like giant fluted spear points. So when people started finding other ones around here, that was still pretty interesting. They weren't quite as big, but you can tell they're large, they're robust, they're often serrated. Um, and that starts the seriation, the, t the um, chronology. Of, of points in Western Washington. And this graphic shows the reduction process. So, you know, a native person would get a, a, a stone cobble and they'd start chipping it away and they'd take one of those big chips or flakes as we call them and they'd chip that even further and they'd refine it to a spear point or a scraper or things of that nature. Um, but the really old sites, uh, we call them old Cordier in tradition, um, are really large, robust, thick, heavy pieces. And the uh, Old Cordilleran tradition, or Old Cod tradition, ranges from about 5,000 to 10,000 years old. Didn't have a lot of innovation, technologically speaking, in that time. So it's kind of like Converse shoes. Here's an ad from 1949. On the right-hand side is a shoe that you can buy right now at the Nike store. Didn't change very much over that span of time. Same thing with old cot. So if you find really chunky, large leaf shape, really um, early stage kind of stuff, you know it's really old. Here's some actual artifacts from those two sites up in Granite Falls. You can see the slide on the left is the core, so that'd be like your, your base material that you would start knocking the flakes off of. On the right hand side is the is the bone or the faunal assemblage. So it's pretty cool that even though there's only a couple of pieces of really, really tiny fragmented bone, it's really cool that it survived because the acidic soils, again, tends to decompose all the organic material. Here's a slide that shows you pre-contact sites around Redmond. Um, as you can see, there's a big cluster right around here, right around the north end of the lake. Bear Creek is one of them. There's another site called the Marymore site, which is a really famous site. Um, but as you can see, a lot of them are focused on the water around the lake, around the drainages, um, a few over by Lake Washington. So water was really important to native groups. Um, not only was it for drinking water, but any sort of shoreline or confluence, river, things like that, you would find a lot of resources, whether it be fish, shellfish, other things around there. And so people tended to do their their um, gathering sites, and then their base camps, and sometimes their villages. So there's a lot happening in Redmond. What I like to say to people is, if a place looks pretty cool now, it looked pretty cool back then. So if you wanted to camp there or have a house there right now, people probably wanted to do that a couple hundred years ago or a couple thousand years ago. 
And as we can tell from Bear Creek, almost 13,000 years ago. So that's pretty exciting. So the Marymore site, 45 KI-9, was one of the first documented sites in Kitsap County, or excuse me, King County. Um, it's right over there in Marymore Park. And as you can see, there is a wide variety of stone tools and um, different material types. The ones on the bottom left, the darker gray kind of material, that's local material, probably basalt or dacite. The other ones look like chert, jasper, chalcedony, which would be from Eastern Washington or maybe Oregon, things of that nature. Um, so that would imply trade networks. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the Marymore site is based, um, the, the date ranges um, go from about 6,300 years ago to about 8,100 years ago. And there's been several dating methods done to cross-verify or cross-reference the dates. Um, the site, the, the funnel assemblage, the bones, was reanalyzed a couple of years ago by Chatters and Brown. Um, they took some of the burned bone pieces and reanalyzed them to help refine the dates and um, things like that. So even if something was dug 50 years ago, we can still use newer technology and newer methods to elicit more information from sites. So that's pretty exciting. Lots of other pre-contact sites like we saw. Here's just a you know, couple of pretty pictures of what's been found in the area. You've got some faunal bone, animal bones. Um, you've got some stone tools. So these other pre-contact sites, again, are a lot of them are based on the eastern shoreline of Lake Sammamish, um, river terraces, confluences, river valleys. Bear Creek is like the rock star of archaeology sites in Redmond, and honestly, Western Washington, because it is so old. So the exciting thing about Bear Creek is it's about 3,000 years older than any of the other sites around. That's pretty amazing. So um, Bear Creek. It just represents, um, probably represents a multi-resource base camp or limited procurement or processing location. Um, there was a buried peat layer, which was dated to between 8,000 and 10,000 years old. And underneath that was the cultural layer, which dated between 10 and 1,200 years ago, roughly. So there was more than 3,600 chipped and ground stone artifacts. So most of the sites that, that um, we might encounter, you might get one artifact or a handful, maybe a couple hundred, but 3,600, that's a ton. And that just shows you the um, breadth of information that you can, that you can um, elicit from archaeology sites. So the cultural layer is like a time capsule, right? So the peat layer was on top of it. Peat grows really, really slowly. It accumulates slowly. So you know that it's capped this intact cultural layer for a long time. So the artifacts at Bear Creek are like opening up a time capsule. It's a pretty amazing find, pretty amazing surprise. Because you never know what you're going to get where. So, And then taking all this together, what does that mean? What, why does this even matter? Well, if you look at all the different sites from around the area, um, there's been seriations or chronologies based on projectile point types. And you can see how the different projectile points, um, shapes, sizes, things like that, there's certain date ranges. So when you find something new, like the, sli the first slide, you can automatically tell roughly how old it is, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so Bear Creek dates to about 1,200 years old, between that 10 to 12,000 years old. That's much different than the Granite Falls site, which was about seven to 9,000 years old. The Marymore site right across the street was about five to 6,000 years old. So Bear Creek is probably 6,000 years older than Marymore. They're not that far apart. So that tells you that people have been using the Redmond area thousands of years continually. So again, Redmond's a pretty happening place. 
here's just another example of projectile point cross dating. That's one of the methods that archaeologists use to um, determine age ranges. So innovations over time. This, it's like the old school roller skates. You kids probably have no idea what old school roller skates are, but the rest of the audience probably does. So it's like going from that to going to roller blades. There's been a ton of technology changes over time after the old clock phase. So um, projectile points became smaller, more refined, um, like going from spears to dart points. And again, what does all of this mean? Some of the this, um, projectile points are made from chert and chalcedony and obsidian. Well, with um, obsidian sourcing and other methods, we can determine where these artifacts came from. Um, so obsidian sourcing, you would do chemical analysis, and bedrock crops have been analyzed chemically. And so you can tell, oh, this piece of obsidian came from Eastern Washington, or this piece came from Oregon. Well, that's pretty far, because people didn't have cars. They didn't have horses back then, right? So that's a long way for somebody to walk. So then you can see the trade networks forming, and that's pretty exciting, too. Tons of different analysis methods that can be used. Um, this is really all the science and engineering and all the stuff you kids are probably really interested in are coming from. Radiocarbon dating, usually we do that with charcoal or wood or shell or bone. Um, Radiometric dating, you can date pollen, you can uh, source the obsidian, you can do thermal luminescence, all kinds of other really, really cool stuff. Um, for historic period sites, you can look at different bottles and cans and ceramics, and there's manufacturing dates and um, different, different clues um, that can tell you how old things are. Where, where do people work? Where do I work? Well, I work for a private consulting firm, a cultural resources firm. But archaeologists work all over the place. You can work for state or local agencies, maybe, um, maybe a city, maybe a county. You can work for national agencies, like National Park Service, um, Army Corps of Engineers. You can work for local tribes. They often have historic preservation programs, um, colleges, universities. You can be an instructor. You can be a researcher. Um, museums. Some people don't like to dig, and that's okay. You know, it's all right. It's all right. So you can work in a museum. You can um, take the collections after they've been repackaged and care for them there. Here's a few more photos of archaeologists in action. So on the left is a survey we did out in Marymore Park. Um, we dig a couple holes, you know, screen some stuff. When you find something cool, like the very first slide, is when you have a larger group of people come out and really um, investigate scientifically what's happening there. And that's when you get things like this. This um, testing and data recovery. So you know, we have a project, we find something, or maybe the construction crew finds something, and we go there and we investigate a little bit more. And when it looks like there's something that might have significance um, legally in the regulatory compliance world, you can get a permit and you can do testing and data recovery, which is um, these larger excavations. Sometimes we monitor construction. Sometimes we monitor geotechnical bores. There's one of our archaeologists and she's checking out a soil sample. Sometimes we bring them back to the lab and we look at them there. So you can slice open the the core tube, and you can go through them carefully, and we note the different soils, organics, cultural materials that are there. You can get the stratigraphy, the, the layers of the earth. Um, you can tell what's been happening there. Well, after you have a site and you get some artifacts, what happens then? Well, we bring them back to the lab and we clean them up. We don't want to send them to the museum dirty. First of all, they, don't, they won't take them that way. Um, in this way, we can really see what's happening, and we want to preserve things as best as possible. So you clean them up, and then you can package them up in the records, and you um, put them in the repository. Again, if you decide you don't really want to dig in the dirt, and you don't really want to handle the dirty stuff, you can go into collections management. That's on the left-hand side is our historian, Katie. She actually was helping to monitor the um, 
an exhibit for the Terracotta Warriors at the Pacific Science Center. So she's doing some really cool stuff. We have other specialty disciplines that anybody can get into. There's Tom, he's doing a faunal analysis, so he's looking at the animal bones. He's also our osteologist, so if we have something that we maybe think is human, he can tell the difference right away. Um, people look at the lithics, so stone tools, the shell. We have a um, variety of other things. Our geoarchaeologist, he looks at all the environmental data. He can look at the soils and tell you what's happening. Um, we have a historic and industrial archaeologist. She can tell you what's happening with different, um, you know, built environment kinds of things. So bridges, mining complexes, buildings, things of that nature. She can also um, give a, a better detailed understanding of historic period artifacts. We even have an underwater archaeology program, not very common in Western Washington or the Pacific Northwest, um, but in places like Florida or the Caribbean or maybe down by Texas or Mexico, people are doing a whole bunch of underwater archaeology there um, to find submerged resources. Overlapping careers. Maybe you don't really want to be an archaeologist, but it's kind of cool, but not exactly what you're thinking. Okay, that's fine. There's plenty of other things for you to do. You can become a historian. You can do background research. You can go to the archives. You can go to the libraries. You can do some of that more detailed analysis looking at maps. You can become a GIS analyst. We have a really strong relationship with our GIS guys at work. They help us georeference historical maps. They, they help us. Um, put our project areas on electronic tablets so we can go do our surveys and our um, field work. They take the data that we've input into these electronic tablets and they magically give us data back in Excel tables and they make maps for us. Um, they can also do predictive modeling, which will tell you um, based on certain factors and criteria, where might a high probability for intact cultural resources be in your project area. You can also do the curation or the collections management. That's what I kind of like, like interning at museums and volunteering. Um, so take the collection. You can catalog it. You can put it in little baggies to your heart's desire, like I like to do. And um, you save it in archival quality materials so that the, the materials themselves um, don't degrade. And then they're there for people to research, and they're there to um, to protect. So, thank you. I just want to say thank you again to Kim and the city for inviting me to speak today. I want to give a shout out to my coworker Katie Wilson, who helped compile the research and the photos, and Julie Bear, who's our graphic designer. She helped with the presentation. And I want to just say thank you to the various archaeologists who helped. Um, provide the data and allow me to use some of their sources, in particular Bob Carpel in the back there, uh, Jason Cooper and James W. Brown um, allowed me to use some of the information from their work, and then all my cultural resources colleagues at ESA, Chris Lockwood in the back there, uh, Paula, Alicia, Brian, Chris Yamamoto, Tom Ostrander, Katie, and Shonda Schneider for their support and encouragement. Questions? Comments? Kim? Can you talk about the size of material that you find here in this area? I'm particularly interested in um, places where people are making tools. And how do you know that you might be upon or coming upon a site where there was tool making? So some of, the, some of what we find, we call it debitage. It's really tiny. Some of it's really tiny, some of it's bigger. It just depends on um, the raw materials. Basalts and things like that usually have bigger, chunkier, um, coarse grain volcanics. Some of the finer grain things chip off really, really tiny, like the chert and the chalcedony. Um, so you never know what you're going to get. Uh, if, it looks, if it looks like a weird rock, then usually what I do is I ask one of the other people in the crew. Or um, we have a couple of guys who do some of the lithic analysis. So have somebody double check you. Um, and just go from there. So some of the things um, are bigger. Some of the projectile points might be this big. Some might be this big. So you can go from here to here. And, and then like if you're in Snohomish County at the Olcott site, you know, some things are going to be really, really big. 
uh, Bear Creek, they were pretty impressive, some of them. I know I, um, I was fortunate enough to go on a site visit. Bob and others uh, arranged for um, archaeologists and different people to come tour the site. Um, and it was pretty amazing. They let me hold one in my hand. It, there was foil underneath it, so I didn't get to actually touch it, touch it. But um, it was so pretty amazing to hold something in my hand that somebody had made like 12,000 years ago. And then I'm holding it there. And it was, you know, it was pretty good size, about the size of my palm. And that was a broken piece. So, you know, these things are pretty big. Yes. Yes. So the, the, the question is, is when you find those exotic non-local materials like chert, calcetany, things like that, when do you start finding those? Um, specifically chert? I don't have a specific answer, but I could get back to you on that. Um, it, I mean, we find them in sites that are, you know, eight, nine, ten thousand years old is, would be my base answer. I mean, I would have to get... Um, so the question is, is he's been finding things in his vegetable garden for years, stone tools. How does he get somebody interested in, in looking into this a little further and dating them? What I would say to you is we should write up a site form for you. Um, uh, if you are finding an archaeology site, stop. Don't dig into it because if it's a known site and documented and recorded, if you dig into something without a permit, that's a class C felony and a fine. Um, <laughs> So what, I would s so what I would say to you is once you start digging in an archaeology site, it starts losing the context, right? So um, it's losing scientific information. Um, how does one thing relate to another horizontally, vertically? You, maybe you're digging up um, something with charcoal. You might not even realize it's, it's a thing, right? So um, once you realize it's something... Right. Um, I would say you could probably call the Burke Museum. They might have some answers for you. I would say you can call the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Um, I can give you a business card, and we can talk later. Um, but uh, once you start finding sites and you want people to work on it, typically there's contracts and projects and funding streams and regulatory nexus kinds of things to consider. So. Um, but I'll give you my card, and we can chat. Yes? So you're saying that the ice receded from the Puget Sound region about 17,000 years ago? About 16,000 years ago, yes. 16,000 years ago. Yep. Dating this stuff to like 12,000 years ago. Yep. So as there's a nexus kind of tool, you see the evolution of the tool, it looks like, you know, at the Bear Creek they're very square and kind of blunted, and then they become more point-like and then more refined point -like. Is there, are you seeing or are you able to trace an evolution in the people that were here as well? I, I know we've been talking about the shoots and the other local tribes, other east of town here, so we do all of this in Palm, but are, are, you, are you able to identify who made the tools? So the, Those yeah. Ancestors of people that are still here. Okay, so the question is, is we're seeing the different types of tools like at Bear Creek and other sites, and you can see the progression of that. Can you see the progression, like the migration chain of the different people who lived here, and basically what group would belong to what tools? What I would say is a lot of the tribes today are based on reservations that were put there with the treaties, right? So a lot of the peoples were kind of forced to coagulate in some respects. Um, territories overlapped. So the Muckleshoot, Snoqualmie, different other local tribes had resource areas that they used together. 
um, simultaneously over the thousands and thousands of years. Um, they might have some that they identify more with than other tribes, and that's something that the tribes would have to speak to. I'm not a tribal member, so I wouldn't want to um, voice any specifics about um, who, you know, the exact boundaries or whatever. The maps that we have today, that's sort of a Euro-American construct, right? So tribes use the landscape. They've, they've been here, um, from my understanding, in their worldview since time immemorial. So there's just a different perspective. Um, if there's a project and there's Native American artifacts that are found, you, the responsible thing to do is you contact all of the local tribes that are interested, and usually there's a list, um, and they usually will coordinate with the cities or counties or whomever the client is, and um, you can figure out what tribes would be in what region, and they'll let you know if they're interested in your project and they'll find or not. So, so the short answer is you can't pinpoint it exactly, but you can kind of, you know, get a good understanding of the tribes that are interested in certain areas. Yes? Okay, great question. So the question is, why is there such a concentration around the north end of Lake Sammamish, Bear Creek, and not so many around Lake Washington? Short answer is, I went on the super secure database website um, that the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation has. You have to have certain credentials in order to access this information. Archaeology sites are not um, available for public information um, location-wise. Um, so I was able to go on there and I looked at the map and I made a mock-up of that and I only picked the prehistoric sites. So there's other sites that have prehistoric and historic components. So maybe there was a prehistoric layer or pre-contact layer, excuse me. Um, and maybe historically somebody came along later. I didn't choose those sites to represent. The, that was just a representative sample that I picked. So, because I was concentrating on the pre-contact stuff. Well, that's a great question. So when something becomes an archaeological site, once it's recorded and you know it's there, when do you stop digging there? Does it always stay there? It depends. So when you start recording a site, it um, gets formal documentation. It depends on the project. It depends on what's happening. You could be at your home and have an archaeology site, and you can get that written up as a site and then just leave it be. And that's the end of that. Uh, you might be deciding to you know, rechannelize a creek, like Bear Creek. And then there's certain other things you have to do to, to keep the project going, but um, have other interests as well, like the tribal interests, the, you know, natural environment interests, things of that nature. So there was a whole process that happened with Bear Creek, for example, regulatory process, where you had Washdot, I believe, and some other, um, the city and the tribes and the archaeologists involved. And they um, came up with a memorandum of agreement, I believe. Um, so there's certain things, and then they decided on testing and data recovery, and that information allowed them to move forward with the project um, and redesign it a little bit, from my understanding. But it still allowed the project to continue because we were able to get information scientifically from that. So it all depends on um, who's involved and the agreements that they come to. Yes? Um, the Bear Creek dig that they did in 2013, they find baskets, pottery, like So the question is, is the Bear Creek um, excavation, did they find baskets and pottery? Um, Pre-contact Northwest Coast did not have pottery. So um, I did not work on that site. I toured it a little bit, and I've uh, read part of the data recovery report. But I would almost guarantee that there's no ceramics there. Basketry, that's pretty rare, again, because the acidic soils, things like basketry, anything cedar bark, anything wood, shell, bone, tends to decompose on the really, really old sites. 
as far as I'm aware, there was no basketry. But again, I'm not the expert on Bear Creek, so um, caveat that. So the projectile points from Bear Creek are similar. Um, they look a little similar to some of the older Olcott sites, but they're different enough. So they are sort of reminiscent of Clovis in the fact that they're large and fluted and serrated and really robust and thick. Um, but they're different enough that you can tell that it's a different time period. And then all the other dating mechanisms, dating the charcoal and the peat and all, a variety of other dating mes mechanisms, you can tell that they're older. Yes? Uh, do you ever find human remains in any of these places? And if you do, what do you do about it? Good question. Do you ever find human remains in these places? And if so, what do you do about it? Yes. Knock on wood, I have not found human remains out on a project, but just about everybody else I know has. What do you do? There's state protocol. You call the coroner or the local um, medical examiner and law enforcement. And you call your client and you call your boss, right? So you tell everybody, I think we got something. You do not call the media. You do not tell anybody else. You cover the remains respectfully, like maybe with um, a tarp or some sort of blanket um, to protect them because you don't want to mess it up. You don't know if it's a crime scene or not. That's why you call the coroner or the medical examiner. So coroner comes out, determines, okay, it's not a crime scene. It wasn't, you know, anything from the last, you know, however many years. And then there's a call to the state physical anthropologist, Guy Tassa. So then Guy comes out to the project site and he says, okay, and he takes the remains and he deals with them. So then he um, contacts the local tribes and there's a regulatory process that happens there. And then they decide what happens with the remains, how it gets you know, reburied, things like that. And any associated funerary objects too. That's all protected under law. Yes? That is a good question. So what does the age of Bear Creek relate to Kennewick Man? I'm not an expert on Kennewick Man um, off the top of my head. I don't have dates for that, but I'm guessing maybe nine to 10,000 years old. So I think Bear Creek is older than that. I would have to double check that. But off the top of my head, I'm gonna say yes. But again, I'm not an expert on Kennewick Man at all. Um, just because I'm an archaeologist, I don't know everything. Shocker, I know. But, um, but I would have to double check that. So. When was the first excavation in Bear Creek and when was the last one? Again, I did not work on the Bear Creek site. I believe it was found, I want to say in 2008, through a survey. Right? And I believe the last one was maybe 2000, 2013? Okay, I got expert in the back, so. No, no, this was found within the last 10 years. That's what makes it so incredibly exciting is Mary Moore was found in the 60s. So you're talking something that was found 50 years ago and that's right across the street. Bear Creek is pretty much right here in your backyard, and that was found in the last 10 years, and it's 6,000 years older than Mary Moore. So you never know what you're gonna find. And that's the exciting part about archeology. span It's kind of like a, you know, treasure hunt, even though you don't really wanna say treasure hunt. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> don't go out there and dig, people. Do not go out there and dig. Um, but it's, it's like getting different pieces of the puzzle and putting them together. So every site that you find, it's flipping over a different puzzle piece. And then the more information you have from the region or the area, it starts filling it in. And you get this beautiful mosaic, if you will, of what's been happening here and how people lived and worked and, and you know, conducted their lives. Yes? So, and I appreciate you're not a, an expert on Bear Creek. Yeah. Specifically around that, you mentioned just the volume that you've got on that relative to other ones. Do, do the people that do, did work on it, 
do they expect that it's complete, that they've found most of what's there, or is this the tip of an iceberg, and frankly, it could have continued for another half mile and in other directions? Okay, so the question is um, that the amount of artifacts that came out of Bear Creek, the experts that are that are working on the site and all that, do they think they got everything or do they think it continued? I would say there's probably more stuff there. Um, when we do testing and data recovery, we try to only sample sites so that stuff is protected because in the future, there's going to be better scientific methods. There's going to be better um, ways to protect and preserve. So even when we're doing our work, we're still taking that information out. We're still, you know, messing up the context. We're taking it and we're, um, you know, getting that information. But the original, you know, pristine context is taken away. If you leave something there or a piece of something there, that stays protected, presumably. Unless you have, you know, natural disaster, flooding, you know, somebody goes around and, you know, digs it up or something. But if you leave it there, then in the future, you can get different and better information, presumably. So. Okay. Well, Thank you again, everybody. I hope I've answered your questions, and I hope I got the Bear Creek stuff right. Um, yes? Yeah. Bear Creek has been moved three times. So uh, when you say it's the Bear Creek site, Bear Creek site was originally on the Merrimore Lake. It was south of 520 Causeway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it's nice to call it Bear Creek, but it was probably called something else 13,000 years ago. Because the, uh, presuming that the uh, Sammamish River was in its approximate location back at Penn across your surface. Sure. So uh, I, I just bring that up. To right. So the, the comment is, is it's called the Bear Creek site, but that's been moved couple of times now, historically, and other, you know, stream and river gradients have um, changed course over time. So 13,000 years ago, it probably wouldn't have been called Bear Creek. Well, no, because um, they didn't speak English, first of all. So it would have been some, um, it would have been, um, who knows if there would have been a name for it, then probably. Physicality. Physicality, I believe it was named for Bear Creek because Bear Creek is there right now. Okay. Perhaps we can talk later then. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Kim. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. We really appreciate you being here and sharing this with us tonight. I know there's a lot of new learning that's happening. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here and, and listening. Um, so we're going to move into the second half of our event tonight. We're very excited. Um, I'm Kimberly Dietz, by the way. And this is Tom Hardy. And um, what we're very excited about is that since October of last year, we have been working with uh, Tesla STEM students. Uh, we had 10 students go through an internship with us. And six of them are here tonight to share with you their work. Um, so what, what they're going to be doing is sharing with you research that they have performed regarding the Bear Creek site. And then they're also going to tell you a little bit about their personal experience. And um, for any of the students in the audience, they're going to share a little bit about what they learned regarding careers and career paths in the future. Uh, so we hope that you will stay for that. We're going to do a sort of a round robin so that you'll be able to visit with each of the four teams. Okay, But before that, uh, Tom Hardy, we have a round of thanks we would just like to express while you're here. Thanks, Kim. Um, so yeah, there's a, a bunch of people that have gone into uh, both the internship and um, and the Bear Creek site, of course, um, but but uh, very important people that we'd like to thank. Um, so first of all, uh, we'd like to thank the mayor for his opening remarks and for uh, Jenny for that great um, that great lecture. Um, but we also like to thank um, the. Tesla STEM high school uh, program leaders, uh, Principal Duenas, uh, Jerry Lineker, Mike Town, um, 
And uh, we'd also like to thank the Snoqualmie tribe, the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, the Tulalip tribes, the Stillaguamish tribe of Indians. Um, and then we had several archaeologists uh, join the, the students um, during the internship. Uh, Lucy Flynn O'Quinn came in and spoke with the students about uh, what archaeologists do um, and uh, you know how that how that could be actually be a career um, and uh, Dr. Bob Copperell who was sitting in the back and just slipped out he was the lead archaeologist for the Bear Creek site um, and he came and uh, spoke to the students and we actually went out on the site um, several city staff were involved in the internship and we'd like to thank them uh, Jessica Funt Amanda Balzer and Don Swain for their uh, support um, and uh, we'd like to thank Jenny and her team um, that, that took the students out to the, uh, an active archaeological uh, survey a few months ago. Um, I think it was a really valuable experience and pretty unique. Um, and finally, we'd like to thank the, the students presenting uh, this evening, uh, Emily Compton, Claire Whiteside, Lauren Collier, Indra Kay, Adriana Rush and Josh McNeil. Um, these dedicated juniors and seniors um, have spent many hours over the past six months uh, learning from tribal members and city, t city staff members that range from geologists to um, uh, GIS experts um, to understand the site better and understand its significance. Um, and we hope this internship has pr provided them uh, value as they as they move on in life uh, into college and in their career. Um, and then I'd also like to thank Kim for organizing uh, the event tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so what we're going to do now? We have four rooms that we want.